Welcome back everyone. In this segment we're going to finish our construction of the SNARK and in particular I want to show you all the beautiful algebraic ideas that go into constructing a SNARK. First let's just quickly review where we were and so as usual we fix our, our computing model to be an arithmetic circuit so all computations will be expressed as an arithmetic circuit. Remember an arithmetic circuit involves additions and multiplication gates modulo p. This is not the only computing model that's possible, but it's convenient for us today, so we'll use arithmetic circuits. Again, we're going to be using an arithmetic circuit that takes as input a statement x, a witness w, and outputs an element in a finite field, fp. The first thing that a preprocessing argument does is it will preprocess the circuit and output parameters for the prover and the verifier. Then later on, when the prover receives a statement in a witness, the verifier receives a statement x. The prover can produce a proof that it knows a witness w such that cxw is equal to zero, and the verifier will either accept or reject that proof. And for this to be a snark, the proof has to be very short, meaning logarithmic in the size of the circuit, and the verifier's work to verify the proof should be very low, meaning logarithmic in the size of the circuit, although the verifier is allowed to work in linear time in the size of the statement x, because the verifier at least has to read the statement x. Okay, so in the last segment, we looked at one particular paradigm for building a snark, which combines two components. Now, there are other paradigms for co constructing a snark, it's just that this paradigm is the easiest to explain, so we'll stick with this one. So the paradigm basically builds a snark by combining two different components. The first component is what we call a functional commitment scheme, and the second component is what we call an interactive oracle proof. The functional commitment scheme is where all the difficult cryptography happens, and the interactive oracle proof is more of an information theoretic component whose security does not depend on any complexity assumptions. We combine these two together and we obtain a snark for general circuits. Now, in our presentation today, we're going to look at a particular instance of this paradigm, where the functional commitment scheme is actually what we call a polynomial commitment scheme, or a PCS. And if we're going to be committing to univariate polynomials, the corresponding interactive oracle proof is what we call a polynomial interactive oracle proof, or a poly IOP, which is basically an interactive oracle proof that's designed to work with a PCS. We combine these two together, and we end up with a snark. Now, in the last segment, we, we saw a number of polynomial commitment schemes. So let me quickly remind you what a polynomial commitment scheme is. Basically, it allows the prover to commit to a polynomial of degree at most d over this finite field fp. This is a univariate polynomial. So the prover commits to this polynomial f, and later on, the prover can open the polynomial at any point u. In other words, the verifier can send over a u, and the prover can prove that at the point u, the committed function satisfies f of u is equal to v. Now recall that this proof by itself needs to be a snark, which means that the proof size and the time to verify the proof should be most logarithmic in the degree of the polynomial. So again, the polynomial can be of degree 1 billion, huge degree polynomial, the commitment to the polynomial is going to be very short, the proof that the polynomial evaluates to v at, at the point u is going to be very short, and the time to verify this proof is also going to be very short, namely at most logarithmic in the degree of the polynomial. Now in the last segment we saw several polynomial commitment schemes, we mentioned that the KZG one is the one that's most widely used in practice, but there are other ones that have different properties. Once we have a PCS, we can combine it with a polynomial IOP to actually obtain a snark. So what is a polynomial IOP? A polynomial IOP basically is a way to prove that in fact the prover knows the witness w such that cxw is equal to zero, but the polynomial IOP works in a very particular way. The way it works is basically, again, it pre-processes the circuit C to generate prover parameters. At the same time, it also generates verifier parameters. However, now the verifier parameters are going to be simply commitments to a number of polynomials. So the only thing that SV contains are commitments to polynomials. In this case, there are S plus one polynomials that are committed to. Remember, this is what I mean by a polynomial in a box that denotes a commitment to a polynomial. So the verifier's parameters basically contain S plus one committed polynomials, and that's it. And then when the prover wants to prove that it knows a witness for a particular statement X, the proof again proceeds in a very specific way, meaning that the prover sends a commitment to a polynomial, the verifier in response samples a random element of the finite field, sends this random element to the, to the prover, the prover sends a commitment to another polynomial, and this continues on and on until the verifier finally samples its last random element from the finite field, 
the prover sends its last commitment to a polynomial, and then finally the verifier runs this verify procedure, which is allowed to query the committed functions at any point of the verifier's choosing. Okay, so for any point that the verifier wants, the verifier can say, please open one of these functions at the given point, and the prover will provide the verifier with the value of that function at that point. So this is what a polynomial IOP is. In the last lecture, we described what the security properties of a polynomial IOP are, and they mirror the security properties for a pre-processing argument system in general. Namely, it needs to be complete, it needs to be knowledge sound, and optionally, it needs to be zero knowledge. So again, in the last segment, we explain how you can combine a PCS with a polynomial IOP. And as long as the polynomial IOP only commits to a small number of polynomials and the verifier only makes a few queries to the committed polynomials, the end result actually is a snark. What we didn't do in the last lecture is construct an actual polynomial IOP. And this is our goal for this lecture. So what I want to do is show you the beautiful algeb algebraic ideas that go into constructing a polynomial IOP. There are many polynomial IOPs out there. We'll do this using one example polynomial IOP called Planck. And again, I want you to remember that a polynomial IOP like Planck plus a polynomial commitment scheme implies a snark. In particular, Planck can also be extended to give us a ZK snark. Okay, so let's dive right in and construct our polynomial. The first thing we're gonna do is develop a few gadgets that are gonna help us to construct the polynomial IOP. So let's start with a very useful observation. This is almost a trivial observation, but it turns out that this one simple observation underlies basically all of the snarks out there. So imagine we're looking at a polynomial f, which has degree at most d, and we are guaranteed that this polynomial is not the zero polynomial. Now suppose we sample a random element from the finite field, and we ask how likely is that f of r is equal to zero? In other words, how likely is it that r is a root of this polynomial f. So maybe I'll pause for a second and let you see if you can come up with a bound for this probability yourself. Well, let's work it out together. We know that because the polynomial f has degree at most d, and it's a non-zero polynomial, we know that it has at most d roots. Again, the fundamental fact we're using is that a non-zero polynomial of degree d can have at most d roots. Well, since r is chosen at random from a set of size p, the probability that r hits one of these d roots is at most d over p. And so the probability that f of r is equal to 0 is at most d over p. Now, let's suppose that p is actually relatively large, so something like a 256-bit prime. And let's suppose that the degree of the polynomial is not too big. Let's say it's at most 2 to the 40, which is something like a trillion. So let's say that the, the degree d is bounded by a trillion. Then in fact, d over p, we can view it as a negligible number. And what that means is that if, in fact, we choose a random r in the field, and it so happens that f of r is equal to 0, well, it's negligibly likely to happen if f is not the zero polynomial. Therefore, we can deduce that f is the zero polynomial. So again, what this means is when we choose a random element in the field, if f of r happens to be zero, we can conclude from this that with very high probability, f is in fact the zero polynomial. It's identically zero everywhere. So this gives us a very simple way to test if a committed polynomial happens to be zero. Right? If we have a committed polynomial, we don't know if it's a zero polynomial or not. What we can do is we can choose a random point in the finite field, ask the prover to open the polynomial at that one single point. If we get zero, we can conclude that this is very likely the zero polynomial. If we got non-zero, then of course this is not the zero polynomial. Yeah, so this gives us a very simple test to test if a committed polynomial is the zero polynomial by only opening the polynomial at a single random point. So this is a very important trick. In fact, this trick is literally used in all the snark constructions out there. And this is actually fundamentally the reason why we're able to build such efficient snarks. Now, what's interesting is in fact, even though I stated this fact for univariate polynomials, it's really quite fascinating, but this fact actually also holds for multivariate polynomials. This is what's called the schwartz zippel de Milo lipton lemma that says that even for a multivariate polynomial, this condition holds. If you have a polynomial in k variables and you choose a k-tuple from the finite field, the probability that f of r is equal to zero is at most d over p, where d is the total degree of the polynomial. This, by the way, is a very interesting exercise to prove. It's not a very difficult proof, 
I'll tell you that you prove this fact by induction on the number of variables. Basically, if there's only one variable, then this fact basically reduces to the condition star that we already know. And for more variables, we prove that the theorem holds by induction on the number of variables. This is a good exercise to try and do, so I encourage you to try and work out the proof of the schwartz zippel dumilo lipton lemma by yourself. We won't need this lemma for the rest of the section, but I, I just wanted to state it because it's such a beautiful fact, but we will be sticking to univariate polynomials and this condition star. Okay, so we have a very simple way to test if a committed polynomial is identically zero. Let's put this fact to use and, de and derive a related observation. So again, we're going to stay with the settings where P is a very large prime, D is, is bounded by 2 to the 40, so the D over P is a negligible value. And now I claim that we get another interesting test that we can use, namely, if F and G happen to be polynomials of degree at most D, again, these are committed polynomials of degree at most D, suppose we choose a random element in the finite field, a random element R, and it so happens that F of R is equal to G of R, so the two polynomials happen to agree at the random point R, we can conclude from this that in fact f is equal to g. So if I give you two committed polynomials and they happen to agree at a random point, that means that with very high probability, the two committed polynomials actually are equal to one another. Why is that true? Well, let's see. So we can derive it from the fact on the previous slide. If f of r is equal to gr, that means that f of r minus gr is equal to zero, which means that the polynomial f minus g happens to be zero at the random point r. But we said on the previous slide, if f minus g happens to be 0 at the random point r, that means that with very high probability, the polynomial f minus g is the 0 polynomial, is identically 0. But if f minus g is the 0 polynomial, that basically means that f is equal to g with very high probability. So again, we get a very simple test of equality for two committed polynomials. Basically, if the prover commits to two polynomials and the verifier wants to test if those two polynomials are equal to one another, the verifier will ask the prover to open those polynomials at a random point r, and if their values happen to agree, then the verifier can conclude that in fact the two polynomials are equal to one another. All right, so we're going to put these observations to use again and again and again throughout this lecture. So let's get started. The first thing we're going to do is derive a couple of more useful gadgets before I can actually show you the polynomial IOP. So to do that, the first thing we have to do is define a certain subset, which I'll call H. This is a very useful subset that comes up in almost all of the snarks that deal with univariate polynomials. The subset is basically generated by what we call a primitive kth root of unity. So we'll say that omega is a primitive kth root of unity if omega to the k is equal to 1, but no, no smaller power of omega is equal to 1, which means that if we look at all the powers of omega, we obtain a set of size k, which is a subset of the field fp. Okay, and I'm going to call this subset, I'm going to call it h. For those of you who remember your group theory, you'll recognize that h is a subgroup, but that's not so important here. We basically are going to use h as a subset of size k. Okay, so let's choose some polynomial f of bound degree d, and let's b and c be some element in our finite field. Now, there are three tasks that the verifier might ask the prover to do. It turns out that for all three tasks, there are very efficient poly IOPs that achieve them. So what are these three tasks? So let's imagine that the prover committed to the polynomial f, and now the verifier wants the prover to convince it that the polynomial f satisfies one of these three conditions. So let's see. So the first condition is what's called a zero test, which means that f is identically zero on the set h. Now f doesn't have to be the zero polynomial. It could be non-zero outside of the set h. But what the verifier wants to be convinced is that the committed polynomial f is in fact identically zero on the set h. We call that a zero test, and we're going to use the zero test again and again and again. This is a very important test to prove that f is identically zero just in the set h. Another task that the verifier might ask the prover to do is what's called a sum check. So sum check basically means that the verifier wants to know that the sum of the values f of a as a ranges over the set h is equal to b. In this case, the verifier again has, a, has the committed polynomial f, it has the value b, and it wants the prover to convince it that the sum of f a over h is actually equal to b. 
Okay, this is called a sum check. And similarly, there's a product check where the verifier has the committed polynomial f and the scalar c, and it wants to be convinced that the product of f of a over the set h is equal to this scalar c. Okay, so these are three tasks that the verifier might ask the prover to do for the committed polynomial f. And it turns out that all three tasks have very efficient polynomial IOPs. So all these three tasks are quite easy to produce a snark for, where the proof is going to be very short, and the verifier can very, very quickly verify that the proof actually holds. I'm going to show you how the zero test works, because that's the simplest of the three, and we're going to be using the zero test over and over again. If you want to see how the product check works, for example, the polynomial IOP for that is in the slides, but I'm not going to go over them in the lecture. So you can check out the, uh, the lecture slides to see how the product check actually works, and the sum check basically works the same way. But for now, let's look at how the zero test works. It's actually a very, very cute idea that allows the prover to prove that f is identically zero on the set h, even though f might not be identically zero everywhere. So let's see how this works. So again, the verifier here has a committed polynomial f. We want to prove that it's zero on this set h that we wrote up here. The lemma that makes this possible is the following fact, which is, again, this is not a difficult fact to prove. I encourage you to think about why this lemma is true. It uses just basic algebra. And the fact is the following, that f is in fact zero on the set h, if and only if the following condition holds, namely, the polynomial f is divisible by the polynomial x to the k minus one. Okay? So if f is divisible by x to the k minus one, then f must be zero on h. And conversely, if f is zero on h, f must be divisible by x to the k minus one. So this should give you some ideas for how the zero test is going to work. So let's see what the prover will do. So the first thing that the prover does is it computes the quotient polynomial, which is f divided by x to the k minus one. Remember that if the committed polynomial f is in fact zero on the set h, then f is divisible by x to the k minus one, and therefore indeed q will be a polynomial. So the prover will compute this quotient polynomial. And what the prover will do is it will send a commitment to the quotient polynomial Q to the verifier. What the verifier will do next is it will choose a random element in the finite field and ask the prover to open the polynomial Q and the polynomial F at the point R. Remember, the verifier has a commitment to F and has a commitment to Q. It's going to ask the prover to open both polynomials at the point R. As a result, the verifier will learn QR and FR. Now what the verifier will do is it will check if f of r is equal to qr times r to the k minus 1. Now what does this mean? Suppose this equality actually holds. What this means is that the polynomial on the left is equal to the polynomial on the right at a random point r in the, in the finite field. But by what we just said, if two polynomials agree at a random point, with very high probability the polynomials are actually equal to one another. So the verifier can conclude that with high probability, the committed polynomial f is actually equal to q times x to the k minus 1. But by our lemma, if f is equal to q times x to the k minus 1, this means that f is in fact 0 on the set h. And so the verifier can accept f as a 0 polynomial on h. Otherwise, the verifier will reject. Okay, so basically, this is how the zero test on h works. And the theorem, which basically we kind of talked through its proof, says that this protocol is complete. If, in fact, f is zero on h, the verifier will accept the proof. And it's sound in the sense that if f is not zero on h, the verifier will reject the proof with very high probability. And basically, the error probability is d over p. So we have to assume that d over p is negligible so that if f is not zero on h, then the verifier will reject with high probability. Let's look at the size of the proof and the verifier's time. First of all, the size of the proof is basically one commitment to the polynomial q and two opening proofs, one for q and one for f. So the proof itself is very short, containing one commitment and two opening proofs. One thing to notice is that the only thing that the verifier does in this proof is it just sends to the prover a random element in the finite field. And as a result, we can apply the fiat chamir heuristic to this interactive proof to make it into a non-interactive proof, right? So in fact, the zero test can easily be made into a non-interactive proof using the fiat chamir transform. So the size of the proof is actually quite short. What's the running time for the verifier? Well, all the verifier has to do is verify two 
PCS openings, and then compute the value r to the k minus 1. Okay, so computing the value r to the k minus 1 takes log k field operations, and so the running time for the verifier is basically log k field operations plus two evaluation verifies. By the way, it turns out that this using the batching techniques that we talked about last time, it turns out we can batch these two openings into a single opening. So really the verifier just has to verify one evaluation opening. And in fact, there's only one evaluation opening that the prover has to send to the verifier. So that's the idea behind the zero test. It's a very cute idea that lets the prover convince the verifier that the committed polynomial is zero on the set H. And what's cute about this is that the only thing the verifier does is just ask the prover to open the polynomial Q and the polynomial F at a random point R. I should actually point out that it's very important that the verifier send R to the prover after the prover committed to the polynomial Q. If somehow the prover learned R before it committed to the polynomial Q, the prover will simply generate a bogus Q that happens to satisfy this condition at the point R. And then the verifier might believe that f is 0 on h, even though that's not really true. Okay, so it's very important that r is chosen after the, the prover is committed to q, so that the prover cannot change its mind about q after it sees the value of r from the verifier. Okay, so this is how we do a zero test on h. And as I mentioned, the sum check and the product check are also described in the, in the slides. If you want to see how they work, just look at the slides. But I'll leave it at this for the gadgets. Okay, so now let's switch gears and talk about the actual polynomial IOP that's called Planck. So our goal is to construct a polynomial IOP for a circuit C. So we're going to do this in a number of steps. So first of all, let's look at a particular circuit just as an example that will serve as our, as our running example. So the circuit actually has two statement inputs, x1 and x2, and it has one witness input, w1. And then, you know, it has three gates, gate 0, gate 1, and gate 2. The first two gates are addition gates, the last gate is a multiplication gate, so the circuit computes this function over here, and we'd like to prove that for a public statement x, the prover has a witness w, such that c of x w is equal to zero. So let's look at a particular example. Let's say the input is five, six, and one. We can evaluate gate number zero, we can evaluate gate number one, then we can evaluate gate number two, and the output of the circuit is going to be 77, given the input five, six, and one. The first thing we want to do is we want to convert this execution of the circuit into what's called a computation trace. So what is a computation trace? It's basically a table that lists the inputs. So here are the inputs, 5, 6, and 1. And then for every gate, it lists the left input, the right input, and the output of the gate. Okay, so for every gate, there are three values listed in the computation trace. So you can see, for gate 0, the inputs are 5, 6, and the output is 11. For gate 1, the inputs are 6 and 1, and the output is 7. For gate 2, the inputs are 11 and 7, and the output is 77. Okay, so that's called a computation trace of the circuit. And basically, given the inputs to the circuit, we can write out the computation trace for the circuit. The output of the circuit, by the way, is basically the output of the last gate in the circuit. So now that we have a computation trace, it turns out we can forget about the circuit and only focus on the computation trace. Okay, that's the only thing that's going to matter for us. And what we'll want to do is prove that the computation trace is valid and that the output actually is zero because we'd like to prove that CXW is equal to zero. In our example, the output is not zero, so this would not be an accepting computation in our model. Okay, so let's see. So how do we encode the computation trace as a polynomial? Well, first I need some notation. So let's say that the size of C is the total number of gates in C. And let's say that the size of I is the total number of inputs to the circuit. And I'm going to split I into the statement inputs and the witness inputs. So the sum of the statement inputs plus the witness inputs is actually the total inputs I. So in our example, we had two statement inputs and one witness inputs, and there were a total of three inputs to the circuit. Now, let's define D to be 3C plus I. 3C plus I is basically the number of entries in the computation trace, right? Every gate has three values associated with it, so that contributes 3C elements to the computation trace, and the input is of size I, so the total number of elements in the computation trace is 3c plus i. And in our example, you can see that d is equal to 12. There are 12 elements in the computation trace. 
And, and similarly, we're going to define our set H to be the set of powers of omega up to, up to a power of d minus 1. Okay, so this is just a notation that we'll use from now on. And what we'd like to do is encode the entire computation trace as a polynomial. So how do we do that? So what the prover will do is it's going to interpolate a polynomial P that's going to encode the entire computation trace. Okay, and let's see how to do that. So how do we interpolate a polynomial P that encodes the computation trace? Well, okay, so let's see. What we'll do is interpolate a polynomial P. Its degree is going to be at most D. And this polynomial is going to slowly encode all the elements in the computation trace. So we're going to start with the inputs. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the, a few negative powers of omega to encode all the inputs. So P, evaluated at three negative powers of omega, will encode the input to the polynomials. In particular, P at the point omega to the minus J will encode input number J to the polynomial. In our case, there are three inputs, so we'll use three negative powers of omega to encode the input. In addition, P is going to encode all the internal wires in the computation trace. And the way we're going to do that is follows. We're going to look at gate number L. Yeah, so we're going to label the gates from 0 to C minus 1, in our case, 0, 1, 2. And what we'll do is require the polynomial P at the point omega to the 3L to evaluate to the left input of gate number L, at the point 3L plus 1 to evaluate to the right input, and to the point omega to the 3L plus 2 to evaluate to the output of the gate. And so for every value of L, the, these three constraints in the polynomial encode one gate in the computation trace. In particular, I wrote out all these constraints for our example computation trace. So you can see here is the encoding of the inputs at omega minus 1, omega minus 2, omega minus 3. Here is the encoding of the first gate. Here is the encoding of the second gate, you know, the left, the right, and the output. And here is the encoding of the third gate. And the output, of course, is the output of the last gate, which happens to be 77. So there are 12 constraints on this polynomial. And if you put 12 constraints on a polynomial, that means that there's a polynomial degree at most 11 that satisfies all these constraints. So the prover is actually going to construct this polynomial P from the computation trace, right? The prover has the computation trace from the evaluation of the circuit. The prover has the input X and the witness W. It computes the computation trace for the circuit and is going to interpolate the polynomial P that encodes the computation trace in this way. So how does it actually interpolate the polynomial? It turns out there are quite efficient ways to do this. In particular, we can use a, the fast Fourier transform to actually construct the coefficients of the polynomial P in time d log d. Okay, so almost in linear time, we can actually compute this polynomial P that encodes the entire computation trace. Okay, what do we need to do next? The next thing we need to do is to prove that, in fact, P encodes a valid computation trace. So what the prover will do is it will commit to the polynomial P to the verifier. And now it needs to prove four things to the verifier. So let's see. So what are these four things? First of all, it has to prove that P correctly encodes the inputs. Yeah, so the input X is actually encoded on a few negative powers of omega. Next, it has to prove to the verifier that every gate in the computation trace is evaluated correctly. If it's an addition gate, it does an addition. If it's a multiplication gate, it does a multiplication. Next, it has to prove that the wiring is implemented correctly. But now, what do we mean by the wiring? If you look at the computation trace, you notice that some values appear multiple times. For example, the second input happens to also be the right input to gate number zero, and it happens to be the left input to gate number one. The prover will have to prove that all these values are actually the same. So this captures the fact that the second input was shipped to gate number zero and to gate number one. Similarly, you can see the output of gate number zero happens to be the left input of gate number two. So we have to prove that these two values, this 11 here and this 11 here, is the same. So the prover will have to prove all these, that all the wiring in the computation trace is implemented correctly. And finally, the prover has to prove that the output of the last gate is zero, so that, in fact, C of XW is equal to zero. This fourth condition is actually quite easy to prove. What the prover will simply do is just open the uh, polynomial P at the point omega to the 3C minus 1. And as you may remember, this actually encodes the output of the final gate. And so the prover will open the polynomial at this point, and the verifier can verify that it, in fact, evaluates to 0. We still have to show how the prover will prove bullets 1, 2, and 3 to the verifier. So let's do this one at a time. 
The first thing the prover has to prove to the verifier is that the committed polynomial P encodes the correct inputs. So the way they do this is, remember, both the prover and the verifier have the statement X. So what they will both do is they'll interpolate a certain polynomial V, and this polynomial is going to encode the X inputs to the circuit. In particular, for every J from 1 to the number of inputs, we'll make it so that V at the point omega minus J will evaluate to the Jth input to the circuit. So in our example, I just wrote down the three constraints. V to the omega minus 1 is the first input. V to the omega minus 2 is the second input, and so on. So in our case, in our example, V would be a quadratic polynomial. Now, what's interesting is that constructing the polynomial V takes time that's proportional to the size of the input X. And remember, the verifier is allowed to run in linear time in the size of X. So the verifier actually has enough time to construct this polynomial V. Next, what they'll do is they'll prove that the polynomial P and the polynomial V agree on all the input points. Okay, so let's define H imp to be all the input points. You can see omega to the minus 1, omega to the minus 2, up to omega to the minus x, right? These are the points that encode the inputs to the circuit. And the prover will prove that the computation trace P encodes the correct inputs, basically by proving that P minus V is 0 on the set H imp. Yeah, and this is basically done using a zero test. So the prover will use a zero test to prove to the verifier that P minus V is zero on the set H imp, and that will convince the verifier that indeed P encodes the inputs correctly. Okay, so we're done with proving that P correctly encodes the inputs. The next thing the prover has to convince the verifier is that the computation trace P correctly encodes all the gates. Okay, so how do we do that? So again, in our example, we have three gates. There are two addition gates and one multiplication gate. What the prover will do is it will compute a certain polynomial S. We call this a selector polynomial, which is why we denote it by S. Its degree is at most D, and this polynomial has C constraints to apply, applied to it. Basically, for every L between 0 and C minus 1, this selector polynomial at the point omega to the 3L will be equal to 1 if the Lth gate is an addition gate, and it will be 0 if the Lth gate is a multiplication gate. So in some sense, the selector polynomial encodes all the gates in the circuit. So again, in our example, we have the first two gates are addition gates. So at omega to the 0 and omega cube, the polynomial values to 1, and omega to the 6 is a multiplication gate, so the polynomial will value to 0. Okay, so in our case, the selector polynomial will be a quadratic polynomial. And by the way, notice that the selector polynomial depends only on the circuit. It doesn't depend on the input. And in fact, the selector polynomial will be computed during the pre-processing phase, because this is a function of the circuit, not of the input. Okay, so now that we, uh, we have the selector polynomial, what is the prover going to do? Well, so there's this important observation that will show us that the selector polynomial can be used to convince the verifier that all the gates were evaluated correctly. In particular, let's define the set H gates, which contains all the powers of omega that are divisible by 3. Okay, so omega cubed, omega to the 6, omega to the 9. You remember, these are the points where the selector polynomial is defined. Now, now let's look at the following complicated-looking polynomial. This is actually not that complicated, but it just looks a little complicated. What this polynomial does is, let's see, for every y in H, in H gates, it looks at Py. Remember, P at a power that's, that's 0 mod 3 encodes the left input to gate number y. Then P of omega y, this is increasing the power of omega by 1. This encodes the right input to gate number y in the circuit. And P of omega squared y encodes the output of gate number y to the circuit. And what this says here is basically that if, if gate number y happens to be an addition gate, then s of y is equal to 1. And so, let's see, we're multiplying the sum by 1 and we're multiplying the product by 0. So what this says is that p of y plus p of omega y is equal to p of omega squared y, which means left input plus right input is equal to output. Similarly, when s of y is equal to 0, which means it's a multiplication gate, then the left term goes away because s of y is equal to 0. The right term will be multiplied by 1. So we have the p of y times p of omega y is equal to p of omega squared y. So again, left input times right input is equal to output.
So you notice that the selector polynomial basically enforces that at gates that represent addition gates, the left input plus right input is equal to the output. And at gates that correspond to multiplication gates, the left input times the right input is equal to the, to the output. So the selector polynomial ensures that every gate, be it an addition gate or a multiplication gate, is correctly encoded in the computation trace that's committed to by P. Okay, so that's the idea. So we built this polynomial that's going to be satisfied at this entire set, which we're going to call H sub gates. So now what the system will do is actually will place a commitment to the selector polynomial in verifier's parameters. And what the prover and verifier will do is they will go through a zero test to prove that this complicated looking polynomial is in fact equal to zero on the set H gates. So you notice that proving that all the gates were evaluated correctly is another zero test on a somewhat complicated looking polynomial, but it is just a zero test on the set H gates. Okay, so that's how the prover will convince the verifier that all the gates were evaluated correctly. The last thing the prover needs to do is convince the verifier that the wiring was done correctly. And this is actually the hardest thing to do. Okay, so what does it mean that the wiring was done correctly? We already said, for example, that the second input is given as the correct input to gate number zero and gate number one. For example, you can see that the output of gate number zero is the input of gate number two, and so on and so forth. So here I wrote all the wiring constraints that, this, that the circuit has. Yeah, so this corresponds to the fact that the six is provided as input to both gates. This corresponds to the fact that the first input is given as the left input to the first gate, and so on and so forth. Right, so we can kind of write all these equalities as the wiring constraints. And now somehow the prover has to convince the verifier that all these wiring constraints are actually satisfied by the committed polynomial P. So the way the prover is going to do that is by constructing a certain polynomial, which we call the wiring polynomial. What does this wiring polynomial do? It's actually a function from the set H onto itself. And what this wiring polynomial does is sort of it, it implements a rotation of each one of these equalities. So what it will do is it will map omega to the minus two to omega to the one. It'll map omega to the one to omega cubed. It'll map, map omega cubed to omega to the minus two. So you notice what this does is it implements a rotation of the tuple omega minus two, omega one, omega cubed. Yeah, that, so that's what this polynomial will do. And we'll do this for every one of the wiring constraints. It basically will implement a rotation of this wiring constraint. Now, I have to admit, this probably takes a little bit of time to, to let it sink in, but the lemma that makes this relevant is the fact that if for every y in the set H, it so happens the P of y is equal to P of the rotation of y, then, in fact, this implies that all the wiring constraints are satisfied. So actually, I'm the first to admit that you probably need to stare at this for a little bit of time to kind of understand how these wiring constraints work and why this rotation actually ensures that the wiring constraints are satisfied. But I'm going to let you stare at this at your own time. For now, we'll take this lemma as a given that to verify the wiring constraints, there's a certain wiring polynomial that's computed. And what the prover has to prove is that P of Y is equal to P of W of Y at all the points Y in the set H. One thing that I want to point out is that this wiring polynomial, again, is a polynomial that only depends on the circuit. It does not depend on the statement X. And as a result, this polynomial W can actually be computed during the setup time. Okay, so in fact, the setup algorithm is going to give the verifier a commitment to this polynomial W. And then the prover will have to prove that P satisfies this equality with respect to the committed polynomial W. Well, unfortunately, there's a problem the degree of the polynomial W is D. And similarly, the degree of the polynomial P is D. If we compose a polynomial of degree D with another polynomial of degree D, we end up with a polynomial of degree D squared. Okay? And so if we did this test as stated here, this would actually force the prover to deal with polynomials of degree D squared, which would mean that the prover would run in quadratic time in the degree of the polynomial, which remember is quadratic time in the size of the circuits. We don't want that. We want the prover to run in linear time or at most n log n time in the size of the circuit. Yeah, if we did the test naively, it would require the prover to run in quadratic time. So actually, the way around this is one of the most clever tricks inside of Planck. And so what Planck does is it has a very cute trick to use a product check over the set H, 
to verify this equality using only polynomials of degree d. This trick is called a Planck permutation trick. I actually wrote down how it works on this slide here, but I don't think I have time to go through the, the details of how it works. If you want to see for yourself how it works, you can just walk through the steps and convince yourself that this will actually verify that p of y is equal to p of wy using only polynomials of linear degree. So basically, this is how the prover will convince the verifier that the wiring constraints are satisfied as well. So now basically we're done. So let's kind of summarize how the Planck polynomial IOP works. First of all, the setup procedure, what it will do is it will pre-process the circuit and commit to the selector polynomial that selects which gates are addition gates and which gates are multiplication gates, as well as the wiring polynomial that's used to verify the wiring constraints. So this is all done in a pre-processing step and the verifier has commitments to both of these polynomials. Now, when the prover has a statement X and a witness W that it wants to prove, what it will do is it will build the polynomial P that encodes the computation trace of the circuit C. It will send the commitment to this polynomial to the verifier, and then it will convince the verifier of the four facts that we just saw, right? So all of these are, are basically proved using zero tests. So it will prove that this polynomial is identically zero on the set H gates. It will prove that this polynomial is identically zero on the input set. It will prove that this complicated polynomial here is identically zero on the entire set H. This proves the gate constraints, the input constraints, the wiring constraints, and finally it will prove that the output of the circuit is in fact equal to zero. Okay, so there are three zero tests and one evaluation test in this entire procedure, and that convinces the verifier that P is in fact a commitment to a valid computation trace, and consequently this convinces the verifier that the prover has a valid witness such that C of XW is equal to zero. And that's basically it. That's how Planck polynomial IOP works. So finally, there's a theorem that says that the Planck polynomial IOP is complete and knowledge sound. This theorem is not very difficult to prove. Basically, all it says is if you give me the polynomial P, because we proved that the polynomial P represents a valid computation trace, by looking at the polynomial P, you can extract the prover's witness. This is where the knowledge soundness comes from. Okay, so we have our polynomial IOP. And one thing that, I, again, I want to stress is that you notice the verifier's parameters are just two polynomial commitments. And what's interesting is these two commitments can be computed with no secrets. They're just a simple pre-processing of the circuit C. Anyone can verify that they were computed correctly. Now, what's important to remember is we can match up this polynomial IOP with any polynomial commitment scheme of our choice. In particular, if we match up Planck with a PCS that does not require a trusted setup, we'll end up with a snark that does not require a trusted setup because the PCS setup is untrusted, and you see very clearly here that the setup for Planck is also untrusted. Anyone can compute the selector polynomial and the wiring polynomial, commit to them, and there are no secrets at all involved in these commitments. And the verifier will use these commitments when it verifies that the polynomial P is a commitment to a valid computation trace. Okay, so this completes our, discuss our discussion of Planck. Now it turns out this polynomial IOP in fact, is quite powerful. It has many extensions. And so, first of all, we'll say that because it only requires three zero tests plus one evaluation proof, that the resulting snark is actually quite short. It's around 400 bytes. And verifying this, this snark proof also is really fast. It just takes a constant number of, of operations. And so verifying this proof takes around six milliseconds. So it's a very short proof relatively fast to verify. The only downside of Planck is that the Planck prover has to compute the polynomial P that encodes the computation trace explicitly. As we said, that could be done in almost linear time. However, it also requires about linear memory. And as a result, when the circuit is huge, computing this polynomial P can require quite a lot of memory. And that actually makes it somewhat difficult to use Planck as we described for very large circuits. And in fact, there are many variations and optimizations of Planck to actually make it work better for large circuits. Now, another interesting extension of Planck is when you think about how we proved the gate constraints, we encoded the addition and multiplication gates into the complicated polynomial that was used to verify the gate constraints. 
Well, it turns out that we can encode other gates beyond addition and multiplication into that complicated polynomial. And that would allow us to do proofs for circuits that have more exotic gates than just additions and multiplications. So sometimes these are called circuits with custom gates. And in fact, Planck handles very easily circuits with custom gates that do more than just addition and multiplication. And that's quite an important optimization for Planck. In particular, there's a, there's a very cute trick called Plokup. I encourage you to look it up. It's a very, very, very elegant polynomial IOP that allows you to introduce gates that do what are called lookup tables. What this allows you to do is actually prove that many intermediate steps encountered during the circuit evaluation actually are members of certain predefined lookup tables. And this lookup is quite an important thing in various applications of SNARKs, including various rollups, as well as key EVMs, which we'll talk about later on in this course. Finally, I'll mention that even though we described Pl Planck as a snark, there's an extension to Planck that makes it into a, a ZK snark. And again, I would point you to the paper for seeing how to do that. So as we said, Planck has wonderful proof size. It's very short. The verifier is quite fast. The only downside is that the prover time and more importantly, the prover memory requirements are actually quite large. And there's quite a lot of research into building better snarks that have faster provers with smaller memory requirements. And again, in the readings, we'll point to some more recent work that gives snarks that are more friendly to the prover. Okay, so this brings us to the end of this lecture. I hope you enjoyed these three lectures and you now get a sense of how these snarks actually work. And so I will stop here and I hope you enjoy the rest of this course. And thank you very much.